Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. This time... We're going to have evangelist David Sumberdorf come and open up the Word of God, and he can make his way up right now. And I appreciate the Sumberdorf family. I've known him for many moons. I think I was calculating since 1998. Close, yeah. And so about that that time, I know them longer than I've known my wife. And and my wife and I were talking after we had visited with them yesterday when they got into town that they honestly feel like parents to us, that, <laughs> that they've prayed for us, they've listened to us, they've given us counsel, they've supported us, they've been an encouragement to us, and, and we so appreciate them. And one of the things that I've tried to do as a pastor is I want to bring in folks that have been a help to me. And if they've been a help to me, I think they'll be a help to you. And so he's always been an encouragement. There's something about the simplicity of how he brings that old of. Uh, Farmhand knowledge of just working at the farm, just making it simple. Uh, this morning's Sunday school message is an example of that. So simple, but yet so profound and such an encouragement. And we're looking forward to opening up the Word of God and being an encouragement. I'm glad that, thankful for the opportunity to be able to share Him. When I came to be pastor of the Riverview Baptist Church, one of the first calls I made was to Brother Summerdorf and said, I'm pastor of this church up in Green Bay. When can we get you in? And immediately try to schedule him in. And we're thankful that he's been so kind in allowing us to continue to get him in over and over and over again. And I think this is the third time here now. Could be. Second or second? third? Maybe second. second? Maybe All right. second. Well, good. I tried to get him flat. in right away. I'm trying to thank you. So second time. Well, then some of you are less familiar with him. But I'm glad to introduce him to you and praying that he'll continue to be a blessing. Thank Amen. you, preacher. Thank you, Dr. Scotty. Good morning, church family. Good to see you this morning. And to those tuning in online, a blessing to have you tuned in as well. My name is David Summerdorf, and uh, travel now. Uh, All the children are gone, but uh, still miss Deb. My wife, 36 years we've been married, and uh, we continue to travel across America. America is our mission field. Thank you already for your hospitality. We've enjoyed the time. Take your Bibles this morning and go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. I want to begin reading in verse number 25. Now here in Philippians chapter 2, in verse number 25, we're going to find a very obscure individual. This individual is so obscure, he's only mentioned twice in your Bible from cover to cover. In both instances, it's here in the epistle to the church at Philippi. His name is Epaphroditus. Look at this in verse number 25. The Spirit of God through Paul says this, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness, because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Verse 27, Philippians 2. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, which would have the idea of very high regard. Notice the reason why in verse 30. Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death. Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. Verse number 25, we see this man's name, Epaphroditus. And Paul ascribes to him three incredible titles. He calls him my brother. He calls him a companion in labor. And he refers to him as a fellow soldier. If we could just put it in an easy to remember way, he calls him fellow brother, fellow laborer, fellow soldier. I want to preach to you this morning and our time together this week about the household of Epaphroditus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning again for the honor and privilege to be in your house and gathered with your people 
And Father, we thank you for the honor to call you our Father this morning, to know your Son as our Savior. And as we look out across our land and all the variables, all the things that are changing, all the drama, Father, all the, all the, uh, just the variables that are around us, Lord, we thank you this morning that you and your Son, you're a God who changes not. We thank you, you're the constant. Your son is the constant in a world full of variables. And it is in Jesus' name we pray your blessing on our time. As we consider this man, Epaphroditus, who is very dear to Paul, I pray you would use his life to challenge our lives. Help us this morning to understand what it means to belong to the household of Epaphroditus. Please use your word. Apply it to hearts we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you of the household of Epaphroditus? You know, as you consider this man, first of all, you need to recognize that this obscure individual was a messenger from the church of Philippi. He was assigned to the apostle Paul while Paul was in Rome under house arrest. And he was responsible for the contributions for Paul's support. Paul's life literally hung in the balance based on the faithfulness of this man. And to Paul, he was very dear. He was refreshing. Epaphroditus was, he was faithful. He was loyal and he was sacrificial. And Paul bestows upon him three incredible titles. Look again with me in verse 25. He says, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Title number one, he says, my brother. Title number two, he says, companion in labor. And title number three, he calls him a fellow soldier. Notice with me the first title Paul gave this man. He says, my brother. He calls him his brother. Could I say this morning, that is an amazing title Paul bestows upon this man when you consider who these two men were and where they came from. If you could just have them both on stage right now, let's look at the Apostle Paul. Who was the Apostle Paul? Well, look in chapter 3 of Philippians, just across the the page there on the other side. And here in verse number 5, the Apostle Paul gives you an autobiographical sketch of himself. Listen to what he says about himself in Philippians 3 and verse 5. You could say it, I, Paul says, was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, Paul says, I was a Pharisee. So who was the Apostle Paul? Well, Paul was a Jew, not a Gentile. But he wasn't just any old Jew. He was an ultra-Orthodox Jew, a Pharisee. Acts tells us he was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, which would have put him as one of the most elite Jewish sects in Israel in that day. If you could take Paul and just kind of spin over to the Middle East and say, well, who would he be right now? We saw that picture of the Wailing Wall. We saw the picture of Jerusalem up on the screen this morning. Who would Paul be? He'd be the guy with the fuzzy hat, the earlocks, the long cape, sitting and bobbing every bone into the Word of God as he read it at the Wailing Wall. That was Paul, a Jew, an ultra-Orthodox Jew. Paul would have been someone who was a very powerful, elite Jewish political figure. He was a mover and a shaker in his day. And Paul was a very well-educated, upper-class individual. Pure white collar, if you could say it that way. Paul, this ultra-Orthodox Pharisee, unbelievable, a Jew, well-educated, powerful, elite figure. You say, well, now, if that was the Apostle Paul, who exactly was Epaphroditus? Well, let me just cut to the chase and then fill it in full color. Epaphroditus was the polar opposite of the Apostle Paul. Where Paul was a Jew, Epaphroditus was a Gentile. Where Paul was an ultra-Orthodox Pharisee, Epaphroditus was literally a pagan 
whose name meant belonging to Aphrodite, a sensual pagan female goddess of the day. Where Paul was an upper class, well-educated individual, Epaphroditus would most likely have been a lower class, minimally educated individual. And where Paul was a powerful elite figure in the Jewish community, Epaphroditus was just a worshiper of a common pagan deity. These men could not be more opposite. If you could visit their houses in their day, here would be Paul. He had been raised all of his life hating those Gentile dogs. <laughs> Every joke at his table, it was the Gentile that was the butt of that joke despised by the chosen Jewish people. But if you were to visit Epaphroditus' household from his youth up, he'd been taught to hate and despise those proud, elitist Jews that thought they were God's gift to this world. And let me say, men like these literally had nothing in common. They literally had, were separated for centuries politically. For centuries, they'd been separated socially. For centuries, men like these had been separated culturally and even religiously. They could have easily referred to each other as adversaries. They could have called each other enemies with a snarl. But they would have never called each other my brother. Never. Great walls. Great divisions, great barriers have been built up for centuries between men like these, even in their approach to God. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, and notice how this is described by the Holy Spirit of God in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse number 11, it begins with a command. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. It says this, Wherefore, remember. Look up for just a moment. Just focus here just for a moment. You know, when God tells us to remember something, it's because we're going to be prone to forget this. What does God want you to remember? And what does God want me to remember? Look at it. He says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. Look up. You say, remember what? I can't even tell you what that just said. <laughs> what was... What am I? I don't even know what I'm supposed to remember after all that. Hey, just in a nutshell, you know what God's saying? Don't you ever forget this. You're a Gentile, not a Jew. You're a Gentile. Don't ever forget that. Not a Jew. That's what the preface in verse 11 is saying. Now, just out of curiosity this morning, do we have any Jews among us? We have one. Shalom. Shmi David. So, Your name? Nancy? Amen. Amen. A little afrit. I used a little Hebrew on you there. I said, my name's David. That's my wife, Deborah. Naknum, Alaska. We're from Alaska. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so one. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, we have a Jewish lady among us. You say, well, I don't know. Am I, am I a Jew? Or not. If you have to ask, you're not. All right? Jews know who they are. Amen? So this morning, very specifically, the large percentage, with the exception of one, this is a very specific command to every one of us this morning that are Gentiles, not Jews. What does God want us to remember? Look with me. Ephesians 2, he says in verse 11, don't forget you're a Gentile, not a Jew. And look at what he then goes on to say in verse number 12. That at that time ye were without Christ... And there was a time you and I wandered this world without Jesus Christ. You say, but I was born into a Christian home that didn't make you a believer. Amen? Our Heavenly Father has no grandchildren, only children. You've got to come to Him one-on-one -on -one and make peace with this God through Jesus Christ. You have to enter into that personally 
in that relationship to become a child of his. But as Gentiles, not Jews, and in that time we wandered this world without Christ, here's what we had. Look at this. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. We had no hope, and we were without God in this world. Wow. You know, sometimes we forget as American Christians really how most, uh, for centuries, how this world operated. If you wanted to meet the God of this universe, you had to go to the camp of Israel to find him. He didn't hang around with the Gentiles. Amen? He hung out with the Jews. And access to the God of this universe was very limited and extremely restricted. So restrictive that only one man got close to him one day out of the year. That would be the high priest. In the approach to God as you came into the temple to worship this God, only one man got the room that was smallest, closest, and highest to God. He was the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He had to come in with innocent blood. He, he had to do everything right or God's holiness would destroy him. He got face to face with God for one day. But then the room got a little bigger and a little further from God and a little further down. And that room the, was the place where the Kohanim met, the holy place. And only one group of men, the Kohanim, ministered there. And then you took a step down. The room got further from God, a little bigger. And there one tribe ministered. That would be the outer court. And that was the tribe of Levi. Only the Levites. That's as close as they could get to God. And then you took a step down and went a little further out. And there was the court of the Jewish men. That's as close as a Jewish man could get to the Lord. Then you took a step down and went a little further out. And that was the court of the Jewish women. Very restricted. Very limited. Approaching this holy God. You say, well, where were we as Gentiles? We was the furthest out and the lowest down. We like little kids at Christmas trying to see what was going on over there. Looking over that fence, there's the glory of God. He, he was their God, not our God. They were his people, not us. All the promises were Jewish promises, Davidic promise, the Abrahamic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the new covenant. We were outside looking in like little kids at Christmas, wishing we could get in on what was going on with the glory of God in the Jewish camp. Don't forget where we came from. Don't act like God owes you a thing. For years we wandered outside looking in. He was their God, not ours. They were his people. He was the God of Israel, not us. Amen? Oh, yeah. But then one day someone came along, whoosh, changed the whole formula. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 2 and watch what's said here. In Ephesians chapter 2, pick that up in verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And then it goes on to say this, but now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, that's talking about us Gentiles, were made nigh or brought near to this God, how? By the blood of Christ. Amen? Man, you talk about a game changer. And let me say this, when Jesus Christ came in, and when Jesus Christ came and lived the sinless life, we could never live. He died the sinless death. We could never die. He provided the perfect sacrifice. At that instant, he brought two things with him. When he died and was buried and rose again, two things that this world had never seen before, ever. Number one, he brought equal access to the God of this universe. You ought to say amen right there. Amen. We all outside. We had no access. He wasn't our God. The first thing Jesus Christ brought with him was a vertical change. He brought with him equal access to the God of Israel. Look at what's said here 
It says it right here in verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off, that's the Gentiles, were made nigh or brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Look at this in verse 18. For through him, this Jesus Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access by one spirit unto this heavenly Father. Amen? You know, the theologians call this the priesthood of the believer. Amen? Where once the way was narrow, cautious, limited, and restricted, Jesus Christ comes along, the veil of the temple is rent in twain, and now it's broad and it's bold. He says, whosoever may can now come to this God through my blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen? God didn't have to have us. He'd have done just fine without us. Praise the Lord that he took that from simply one man one day out of the year to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but instead have everlasting life. Boy, the first thing that Jesus Christ brought with him is he brought equal access to the God of this universe. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're a Yankee or a redneck. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're red, yellow, black, or white. Every one of you is precious in his sight. He said, whosoever will may now come. Amen. Amen? That's unbelievable. That had never happened before. In this entire universe. But you know he didn't just bring a vertical change. He brought a horizontal change. Where once there were restrictions. Fellowshipping with the Jew. And the Gentile. Notice here. The second thing he did was give common fellowship with one another. Look at what he says in verse 14 of our text. Ephesians 2. He says for he. Jesus is our peace. Who hath made both one. Both both. Who's the both? Jew and Gentile. He's made them one and it's broken down the middle wall partition between us. That's a, that's a horizontal difference right there. And notice it says in verse number 22, in whom ye also are builded together now for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You know, Jesus Christ didn't just bring a, a vertical change between God and man. He brought a horizontal change between Jew and Gentile. And it's manifested in this local assembly this morning. We have a Jewish lady here and a, Je a pile of Gentiles. That was never allowed to happen. We couldn't gather under one roof in the same room together. Who You say, well, well, who's allowed us to do that? And his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He not only gives you boldness to come before God, but he gives you the privilege of fellowshipping now with one another. Regardless of our differences, the common bond is Jesus Christ. I wrote in my notes, I said, regardless of our social differences, economic differences, ethnic differences, religious backgrounds, personal backgrounds, and let me just throw this one out, even personalities. All of those things are swallowed up all of that diversity is swallowed up by our identity with Jesus Christ. Amen? He changed both dimensions. Vertical and horizontal. And the day we were saved, we became fellow brothers and fellow sisters. Amen? And you know what fellow brothers and fellow sisters enjoy? Fellowship, which is social communication. Brother Max, come on up. I want to grab you. You're my, you're my living um, object lesson. All right. I told Brother Max when I saw him this morning, you should have seen his expression. It was so cute. I walked in, shook his hand. I said, hey, you have more hair than you did when I saw you last. And he got this really weird. And I said, here. Oh, he, he got it. That was, that was pretty cute, setting the hook and reeling that one in. So, Brother Max, I'm going to illustrate here. And uh, I want to just uh, illustrate, and I'll be doing this every night in this series, the first relationship that you and I 
are meant by God to enjoy once we enter into a relationship with Him through His Son. And that is the relationship we now enjoy with one another because of Jesus Christ. Now, when I look at Max, I will guarantee you, and you compare Max to me, me to Max, there's a lot of differences between us. Would you agree? All right, so let's go a few. Some of you are lighting up already. I made a list. Number one, Max, I, 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 I was a farm boy. Yourself? Some, yeah. You were some? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we got a common bond there. All right. Uh, United States Marine Corps. Yourself? No. No military. Okay, that's a difference. There's a background difference there. Um, Boy Scouts? No. Cub Scouts? No. Okay. Big difference there. All right. Uh, my education. What was your education? What, what do you have? Tech school, all right. And uh, yeah, I'm in electronics. Okay, man, we do have some common stuff. All right. Um, I was just a high school diploma. Um, I was raised in an unsaved home. Yourself? Church. You were church. All right, yeah. not me. I'm 59. How old are you? 32. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, so we got a generation gap big time here, okay? All right. Uh, German heritage. Um, I don't know. You don't know? You're a mutt? Yeah, Heinz 57 Mutt. Okay, I'm German, all right? Zumadorf. By the way, our daughter Chandra Sommerdorf married in February Josiah Hackendorf. <laughs> you should have been there for that. I got to officiate that. That was cute. Said you kept it in the German thing. All right, so German. I'm a firstborn. Yourself? Firstborn. Okay, man, we do have a few things here, okay? My personality, I'm total alpha male. I don't know if you caught that. I mean, I'm kind of like step aside, make it wide. Lead foul or just get out of the way. All right, that's me. Um, I'm always up front, always very visible. Yourself? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I mean, we've got major personality difference here, all right? And uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the point I want to make. If you were to take Max and myself and just kind of say, okay, guys, you want to pal around. I mean, there's a few things that we have in common, but yeah. I probably, in normal living, wouldn't be seeking Max out to pal around with, and he probably wouldn't want to be seeking me out to pal around with either. Amen? But one day, someone real big affected both of us. One day, Max saw his need for a Savior. He took a knee, his path crossed with Jesus Christ, and he rose up a new creature in Jesus Christ. One day as an 18-year-old Marine, I saw my need for salvation, and I met the Savior, and I trusted him as my Savior. And the instant that happened, both of us had this boldness now to come before God because of the blood of Calvary. The vertical got affected, but something else happened we weren't looking for. Suddenly, the horizontal got affected as well. And where once we had nothing really in common, Common. We wouldn't have sought each other out. Now we are fellow brothers. And fellow brothers have a unique relationship. They enjoy fellowship. It is a, turn and face me, a face-to-face -face relationship. Though there's all kinds of differences in us, generational, personality, upbringings, and all of that, all of a sudden we have this huge common bond in Jesus Christ. We're singing the same song. We got the same Savior. We got something to talk about beyond the Green Bay Packers. All right? And yeah, who's that, right? <laughs> you, you with me? I mean, and this one we're talking about is bigger than anything else in this whole universe. And we all of a sudden enjoy fellowship. We enter into this face to face relationship because of our common salvation and our Savior. Amen? Amen? That's the first relationship you will enjoy with one another when you get saved, is you got something to talk about. Let me say this. I can sit and talk to you, and if we can spend 15 minutes talking and Jesus doesn't come up in your conversation, something's wrong. Because that ought to be the basis for why we meet. Amen? I know there's other things, but He's the biggest thing. He's the only thing. He's the one that matters for eternity. And that's the basis of why Max and I seek each other out and spend time together now. Amen? Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Now, you be sure to come back tonight, all right? Don't bail on me. I need you for, for another illustration, Brother Max. You know, as we look at this first entry-level thought, notice Paul, go back to Philippians 2, he, this, this, this ultra-Orthodox Jew turns to this pagan Gentile. These guys couldn't be more, more opposite, and he literally calls him my brother. Only Jesus Christ could have done that. 
Only Jesus Christ could have done that. It's, and, and what is the basis of that fellowship? Go to 1 John. Look with me in 1 John chapter 1. And look at it in a single verse how the Holy Spirit of God just sums up this whole thought in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 3. 1 John 1 and verse number 3. He says this, That which we have seen, 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard, 1 John 1, verse number 3. Right near the end of your Bible. 1 John is going to be near the end of your Bible toward Revelation. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. He says, come on, I want this face-to-face relationship with you. Notice what it's based upon. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Jesus Christ. Amen? Boy, I'll tell you, Jesus Christ is the eternal game changer. He's the one that breaks down the wall of partition between us and God. But then He's also that one that goes ahead and gets rid of the barriers between, between us and especially manifested here in this local assembly. He changes it all. And I am oftentimes amazed at how Jesus Christ bridges differences that oftentimes this world will say can never be bridged. We're living in those days right now. Amen. I remember one of the guys that I used to love to come through and I still preach for him. But he was in the hood of Savannah, Georgia. He's on my movie. His name is Kenny Grant. Kenny Grant's an African-American Marine. and He was a chief drill instructor that trained other drill instructors. The guy that led Kenny Grant to the Lord was the same guy, Bill Overway, who discipled me, and he discipled Kenny, and he led me to the Lord. And for years, every time I would talk to Bill Overway, he'd tell me about Kenny Grant. You got to meet Kenny Grant. He got to meet Kenny Grant. You'd love him. And then he would tell Kenny Grant, you got to meet Dave Summerdorf. you got to meet Dave Summerdorf. You'll love him. And for years, both of us heard this. And then one day, we went into evangelism, our family. And immediately, I set a little pin down in Savannah, Georgia, because I wanted to meet this Kenny Grant I'd heard so much about. I remember as I called him and said, here we come, my six children and I, my wife and I. He was in Savannah in the hood. At that time, he had an African-American church, and they literally were shooting each other in the parking lot. I remember as I parked my motorhome in that parking lot, I said to myself, I've never seen a motorhome on blocks, but this could be the first time I've seen it. And when you came to his church house, you had to buzz through double security doors. It was electronic locks, just like a police station. You'd buzz your way in. I remember as we got into that church family, practically all African-Americans, and here's my wife and I with our six children, and I'll never forget that first service I had at Kenny Grant's in the hood. Over here was a baby grand piano. My daughter Kimberly sat at that, and she was playing that. Over here was a, a keyboard with a guy that looked like Ray Charles. Sunglasses, keyboard. Now, if you've never been in an African-American at church, they're going to talk to you. They don't sit quietly. And when they sing, they move a little bit. Y'all with me? The choir was robed. Kenny was up there, and Kimberly, he picked the song, and then Kimberly would go ahead and play the intro. And she played it exactly like it was written, exactly like it was written. And old Ray Charles is sitting over there, and he's listening to her. And then as he joins her, and the choir starts to sway and clap and sing, he'd put a roll to it. He'd start to swing it. Well, Kimberly could hear that, so she'd start to swing it with him. And he's over there like this. He gets a smile on his face, and he's doing this. Yeah, you got it, sister. You got it. I still remember that. We're sitting in the front row. I'm cracking up. Every single song went this way. Kimberly intro, Ray Charles listening. Song kicks in, he swings it. Choir's swaying and clapping and singing and Kimberly joins Ray and he goes yeah you got it so we're cracking up we're watching this thing I get up and preach preach the word of God don't change what I preach I don't care what where I am I preach the same way and I remember afterwards we went to have a meal with the family Kenny Grant his wife his kids as we sat there at the restaurant I turned to Kimberly I said Kimbers I saw something pretty funny 
you all gotta, you got to hear this. And Kenny's listening in. She said, what was so funny, Dad? And I began to explain to her what I saw sitting out in the front row with my wife and the other five children. And Kimberly listens, and Kenny's listening. They're smiling. And she said, oh, that, that's pretty funny, Dad. But she said, I saw something funnier. I said, really? Well, what would you see? And she says, well, here I am. I'm playing that baby grand piano. She said, I look out at the congregation. There's a sea of black swaying and seven white toothpicks in the front row. <laughs> We's honkies, man. We ain't going to move. We just stand in there. We sing it, you know, like Yankee honkies, you know. We into all that motion and stuff. You all with me? I thought Kenny was going to slide under the table laughing, man. He is laughing so hard. I'm going to tell you something. I go into them churches and them mamas will love my wife just as much or more than any white woman I've ever seen. Y'all with me? Them daddies, they'll get around me. They'll hug on my neck. They appreciate the preaching of God's word. They don't want their kids going to hell no more than anybody else does. Amen. They want them turning out right, not wrong. They want their family strengthened. They don't want it blown up. And I'm going to say this with all my heart. You get politicians and the press out of this race issue, we might just get along. But I got one bigger. Put Jesus in it. We definitely would. Because red and yellow, black and white, every one of them is precious in his sight. And that's what's missing today is Jesus Christ. He's the game changer. He bridges those differences. The gospel changes lives. Amen? It's weary today to watch this garbage. And it's darkness that has come in because of the absence of the light of Jesus Christ. Amen? You don't have to invite darkness in when you flip a light switch off. You chase Jesus out of your home, darkness is going to come into that thing. You chase Jesus out of our schools, darkness is coming in. You don't have to invite it and pause to ask it to show up. It is the absence of light. And this world needs Jesus more now, not less. Amen? He's the game changer. He changes that vertical thing between us and God, but He changes the horizontal between fellow believers. Amen? And I want to say this morning, the devil's not happy with, happy with the unity of our family manifested in this local assembly this morning. He tries to mix it up by changing the common denominator. Look in 1 Corinthians with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he did it to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he tried to get the focus off of Jesus Christ. And look at what's said here in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 1 9, he says this God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 9, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship. There's that face to face relationship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at what's said in verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, I beg you, he says, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be how many divisions among you? No, say that word with me, no divisions among you. You know, the devil's never been happy with the unity of the family manifested in a local church, in a local assembly. He'd like to get us focusing on our differences, not the common bond we have in Jesus Christ. And you look hard enough, there's going to be a lot of differences. There's going to be generation differences. There's going to be personality differences. Amen. There's going to be life experience differences. There's all kinds of that. There's racial differences. There's all kinds of differences. And the devil wants to make that the focus. But I want to remind you, when you look at this combining of unlike terms, I don't know who my math people are, but you know when you have unlike terms, we could say this, different people unlike people. You have to have a common denominator to combine unlike terms. Amen. Amen? But you don't need a common denominator to divide. You know who our common denominator is this morning? It's not you. It's not me. It's not your preacher. It's not some political party or some football team. Our eternal common denominator is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're gathered in His name this morning. That's why we're here. We're not gathered in your name. We're not gathered in my name. We're gathered in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who combined us to start with. Amen? 
You need to keep your eyes on the common denominator and not upon the differences. The Father's will is there should be no fussing in the family. Look in Psalm 133 and notice how the psalmist described the sweetness of this unity. In Psalm 133, look at what he says in verse number 1. The Psalms right in the middle of your Bible. If you open your Bible to the middle, you'll hit the book of Psalms. In Psalm 133, look at what he says here in verse number 1. He says, behold how good. Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to what? To dwell together in unity. Oh man, our common denominator is Jesus Christ this morning. He's the one that can bind us. We're here for Him. We're here for His sake. We're gathered in His name. And when we gather, we, we speak about Him. You say, well, what kind of song should I sing? But let me just say this. I, I think of a song that, that probably would be the best. When we gather, here's what we ought to do. So, let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is He. The Lord of lords supreme. Through all eternity. The great I am the way. The truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Yeah. That's why we're here today. Been just a social club. It's not the PTA. It's not a football game. It's not corporate America. The church of the living God. Assembled. And combined. With one common denominator. That will change not. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if that's true this morning. He's the one who combined us. I want to say this. There ought to be a hallmark in your church today that ought to be in every church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Look with me. Look at the hallmark in John 13. Look at what's said here. Don't miss this. In John 13, as we gather today in Jesus' name, as we gather today to lift up the one who combined us and gave us boldness to enter the holiest by, the, by his very own blood, look at what he says is an indicator of discipleship and belonging to him. In John 13, in verse number 35, listen to what Jesus Christ says. John 13, 35. He says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Look up for just a moment. Just look up. Just look up. Jesus said, by this, this one thing, shall all men know you're my disciples. Now, you just pause and think with me how that thought gets completed in even many of our independent Baptist churches today. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have good doctrine. Now listen, I believe in good doctrine. But he doesn't say that. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you got the right Bible. Well, I believe in having the right Bible, but he doesn't say that. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, because you have a powerful missions program. And I believe in missions. We've supported it for, for decades, sacrificially. But he doesn't say that. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because of your soul winning program. And I believe in getting out and soul warning. He's the soul winner. But he doesn't say that. He puts this flag in the ground and he said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. What's he say? Look at it. If ye have love one toward another. Let me say it this way. When lost people come in here, they shouldn't be able to explain you away. They should look at all the differences and go, I don't get it. These people don't tolerate each other. They're willing to die for each other. Amen. They should see Native Americans with white guys like me loving each other Amen. and willing to die for each other and they should go, I don't get it. Y'all ain't supposed to be getting along. Y'all with me? They should see a Jew with a Gentile just loving on each other 
and praying together and worshiping. The, and they should say, I don't get it. Y'all should be hating each other. They've done that for centuries. Y'all with me? We should be different than a business. We should be different than corporate America. They should come in here and be totally blown away by the love. The love we have for each other. It should be indescribable because it comes from someone bigger than you. Who loved this world so much, he got butchered by this world. And his last words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. You know, you hear that and you pause to think, do I really love like that? I can say that's not in us. It's not our heart. We like to find the difference so we can go and discard. We like to find a thing that we don't like that isn't us, but it's them. So we can criticize. We like to find those differences so we can elevate ourselves at their expense or use that as a reason not to sacrifice for them. Isn't it interesting when God knew everything about you, all your filth, all your sin, all your depravity, he still butchered his one and only just for you to give you a shot at heaven. That's very humbling. That's true love. Amen. So you see this morning as we look at this man Epaphroditus, this obscure individual that just for a blip in a second crosses your radar as you read your Bible. He's very dear to Paul and he bears a title fellow brother because of Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did for him. And we have a responsibilities now. Look at our responsibility as I close this morning in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, here's our responsibility as believers your responsibility here in this local assembly, Ephesians 4 and verse number 1. Here's the responsibility, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. Paul says this to the church at Ephesus, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. He's going to talk about a worthy walk for the believer. What is that worthy walk? Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness. With long suffering. Forbearing one another in love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. In the bond. Of peace. You know, as we look at this assignment this morning, and I speak now of Riverview Baptist Church, this Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, is your assignment this morning. If you're viewing online, it can be your assignment within your home, your church family, if this is your church family. You know, what should be our goal? Our goal should be to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To be forbearing one another toward one another in love. In other words, not focusing on the differences, but focus, focusing on that common bond we have in an unbelievable Savior. You say, well, how can I become more unified with my fellow brothers and my fellow sisters? Well, it's the same way that a marriage gets unified. How many times, Pastor, you probably counseled a couple? Maybe uh, the honeymoon is worn off for some people at 72 hours. For some, it could be, uh, you know, 72 weeks. It all varies, you know. But sooner or later, they need a referee. And, oh, my, the first love is gone. And, you know, as I'm counseling with them, and, Pastor, you have too, everybody tries to say, well, no, the goal should be that you all get closer to each other. No, that's not the goal. It's this big triangle. Here's the husband, and here's the wife, and there's Jesus Christ right there. You know what your goal is in your marriage? Your goal is in your church? Your goal is to get closer to Jesus Christ. And the closer you get to Him, automatically the closer you'll get to one another. Oh, and I could throw this out because it's true. We all could get a little closer. Amen. We could. We could get closer. To the author and the finisher of our faith. Fellow brothers, 
fellow sisters. We've been called into fellowship with God through fellowship with his son. And by extension, we've been called into fellowship with one another. The household of Epaphroditus begins with fellow brother, fellow sister, face-to-face relationship. Let's get as close to our Savior as we possibly can. Amen? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.